Good day. I'm Cleveston Haynes, and I'm delighted to welcome to the Central Bank of Barbados and to Barbados, Dr. Patrick Honahan, the former governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, and our 2017 Distinguished Visiting Fellow. Dr. Honahan, a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, joins the ranks of Fred Bergstein, Peter Blair Henry, and Simon Johnson, all previous Distinguished Visiting Fellows of the bank. He has conducted extensive research on monetary and financial sector policy, and in recent times, he has devoted his expertise on evaluating how different policy approaches have affected the overall cost of financial crises in developing countries and advanced economies, and on exchange rate regimes. As the then governor of the Central Bank of Ireland between 2009 and 2015, Dr. Honahan played a pivotal role in resolving the most recent banking crisis, and that's where we'll start our discussion today. Patrick, welcome to Barbados. Thanks for having me. Now, the global financial crisis impacted Europe and Ireland very significantly. How and why was Ireland impacted? Ireland's problems arose a few years before the global financial crisis as the banking sector started to pour more and more money and credit into construction, property development, residential mortgages, and even property speculation outside of Ireland. They used money borrowed from abroad to do that, and they pumped up the economy. It pumped up property prices. It did generate revenue for the government, which the government obviously started to spend. But everything had gone out of kilter. Too, mu too many properties built, too high prices. And when the global financial crisis came, it exposed the weaknesses that had been building up in the Irish economy and created a huge bust. Property prices collapsed, government revenue collapsed, the banks were in big trouble. But were any early warning signs that told you that this might happen? There were early warning signs that things were becoming imbalanced, but I don't think anybody really imagined the combination of events of the global financial crisis combining with a collapse in the Irish market. And nobody realized that the banks had been making such poor calculations about who should get a loan and for how much. What were the economic effects of this, of this crisis? Well, they were very severe. Uh, the economy, uh, economic activity declined enormously. Unemployment soared from about 3 or 4 percent before the crisis to 15 percent. There was a big jump in emigration, and the banks were buzzed. Now, I've, I've read that the, in the Irish economy, uh, private indebtedness is almost 200 percent of GDP. It seems to be a very high ratio for most countries. What is peculiar to Ireland that you had this build up in, in debt? Well, I think there was a terrific degree of confidence in Ireland's growth model, which had been highly successful for the previous, uh, you know, pretty much 15 years of uh, very solid growth. Uh, people thought this would go on forever, that there would be uh, immigration from uh, Eastern Europe and other parts of the world, and there would be always demand for housing and uh, commercial office construction and so forth. So there was this kind of sense of confidence that made people really uh, develop a kind of hubris. Okay. And what was the overall cost of this crisis to the... Well, there are different ways of measuring it. One easy way is to say how much did the government have to put into the banks to uh, make good on, on their losses. And the gross amount was 64 billion euros, which was about, well, it's almost 40% of GDP. Now they'll get about half of that back, but it's still a huge amount and, and much higher than in other countries in Europe, apart perhaps from Iceland. And when you compare the costs in, in Ireland to the Euro rest of Europe, how did Ireland fare? Well, Ireland's downturn, uh, downfall in, in, in terms of, of economic activity was worse than anywhere except Greece. Greece had its own problems not related to the banking system. So you could say that within the European Union and the Euro area, Ireland had the worst banking crisis. So that was a big challenge to deal with that when I came in to, to the central bank and try and uh, deal speedily with the problem, put the banks back on a steady footing, advise the government on how to adjust their accounts to regain credibility in the markets. So what type of measures did you implement in order to address this crisis? Well, the first thing we had to do was to try and find out how bad the situation was, how, how deep was the hole. Uh, that's not an easy thing to find out because 
property prices are falling, it's uh, difficult to say where they'll stop. Banks had to be recapitalized or closed. Some of them were closed, there were mergers, but at the same time the government had to adjust the rest of its accounts. It had to increase tax rates, it had to make some cut cutbacks on public spending because they had been relying on revenue from the property boom which had now ended. So what type of adjustments were made to the fiscal uh, as a result? There were considerable increases in income tax. Actually income tax rates had got quite low by international standards before the crisis but now they have moved back up to uh, much more much closer to the European average. Uh, there were cutbacks in public services as well and there were cuts to public servants salaries. I see that the, the value of the tax in, in Ireland is as much as 23 percent. How, how, how does that impact uh, spending in the Irish economy? Um, well value-added tax is one of the major sources of revenue for the government. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite common across European countries to rely heavily on indirect taxes like value-added tax, but as you say, the Irish rate is quite high. It's higher than in Britain, and that ha has always led to a little bit of uh, cross-border shopping. Yeah, actually it's higher in Britain. It seems to be higher in much of Europe also. Some ones are, are a bit higher, but you're right. Some countries have, have lower uh, value-added uh, and other indirect taxes. What about the financial institutions? Uh, clearly, if you have a financial crisis, there's a potential for institutions to fail. How did the government treat with those institutions? Well, the government really uh, discovered, this was before my time in September 2008, they discovered uh, the severity of the problem rather suddenly. And they took a very sudden and drastic uh, decision to guarantee all the liabilities of the banks. These banks were private banks. They said, don't worry, everything is guaranteed. Uh, this stabilized the situation for a while, but pretty soon it became worrisome to the financial markets that the government had taken on such an open-ended commitment, and indeed that contributed to the loss of market access. The government uh, wasn't able to borrow money at any kind of reasonable rate uh, by the time, uh, you know, about two years after that initial bank guarantee. Yeah, that's an interesting point because a, a number of countries during that period actually gave, uh, as you said, open-ended guarantees. But in your judgment, that is not a sustainable situation for, for governments. Well, it was a, a bit of a pig and a poke because they didn't realize just how, uh, how much this could potentially cost. And it turned out to cost a lot, an enormous lot more than they had uh, imagined it could. And so it, it really, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. Without the banking losses, of course, the government would still have had to adjust their, their spending and their taxation, but uh, more gradually and over a longer period of time. That's not to say that uh, walking away from the banks would have been an easy course either. It's clear that banks are needed in the economy and they need to be there for people to make their ordinary payments and get a bit of credit to run the business. and. Uh, Banks are a, an essential element of, of any economy. So you've got to keep the banking system going. The sweeping uh, general guarantee uh, overdid it, but uh, alternatives would not have been all that much better. Yeah, it, it seems to me that the, the issue always is if you don't give the guarantee in, in those circumstances, then you compromise the financials, overall financial stability. And, and therefore, from, from that perspective, the, the government is between a rock and, and, and a hard place. I think one of the things that they could have done, but didn't have on that moment in that rushed uh, one day decision uh, process, they, they could have enlisted the support of other countries, uh, partner countries in Europe. At that moment, they could have said, well, we have a problem here, but it's a European problem because any problem that arising in the Irish banking system will spill over uh, elsewhere. Now, a lot of help was obtained by Europe later but maybe it could have been done in a more orderly manner and uh, less costly to, to Ireland. So do you, do you think that the interconnectedness between Ireland and the European economies was a strength or a weakness during, during this crisis? I think it, 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 it was a strength in that we were always in Ireland able to, to get the short-term borrowing from the Euro system, from the system of European central banks, to keep the show on the road even when the government wasn't able to raise money elsewhere. Uh, it was possibly a problem before the crisis in that lenders, international lenders to Irish banks 
had a greater degree of confidence in lending to Irish banks because they felt, well, we're just lending in euros. There's no exchange rate concern here. So we'll, we'll, we'll lend freely and openly. The issue which has arisen is the whole issue of bailout versus bailing. And you know, in the post-crisis period, uh, a lot of the policy has changed more as moving towards talk of bail-in rather than bailout. How do you see that? I think we've got to be quite, quite clear uh, uh, about this, that nobody's talking about bail-in for your small depositor, your household, your small business. What people are talking about now is they're looking at the professional investors, the big investment uh, funds, and they're saying, wait a minute, if those are entities are investing in banks, they should be sophisticated enough uh, to calculate the risks. And if things go wrong, those kinds of institutional investors, the big players, uh, should, uh, should have to uh, pay part of the cost, not just have it fall on governments. And I think that's the correct decision, but I don't think anybody should confuse it with the idea that small uh, households or small businesses would ever be uh, bailed in as a matter of policy. That, that would not be the intention of any of that, uh, right. these new ideas. But do you think that there's a risk that these institutional investors may seek to avoid uh, investing in, in banking institutions because of the risks of being bailed in in the crisis? I think they will expect to get a little bit of a higher return if they're in the category of investment in a bank that, that is liable to be bailed in. I think they may also move their money faster than they would, but that's good because that gives you an early warning. It helps the bank uh, supervisors and regulators to move quickly in the case where a bank uh, has got into trouble because it has made uh, poor decisions. In those circumstances, do you see uh, increased uh, responsibility then on the central banks and the government to, to fund these banks in, in instances where the investors start to flee because they fear uh, a potential crisis? Part of the whole package of these new uh, approach to resolution is to uh, restructure the banks in advance so that uh, they can be fixed in an orderly way, mm -hmm. separating what can be bailed in, the professional investors, from what's not going to be bailed in, the ordinary bread and butter banking that, that uh, people are generally familiar with. And that way, the, the governments will not be on the hook. It will be the big investors. At the end of the day, uh, and, and, and their competing theories is, mm. can the government walk away? I think the government uh, can walk away from the big investors. And I think the tradition, for example, in the United States over the years was that except for the very biggest banks, governments did make a distinction between bondholders of banks and the ordinary depositors of banks. And if banks failed, bondholders did suffer. And I think uh, th this is uh, generalizing that approach to, the, uh, to other countries, and in particular to European countries, mm -hmm. uh, is now, I think, a, a, a good way to go. There's a difference between how banks in larger com countries are structured and how banks in the smaller economies are structured, because in, in, in the larger economies, you, you rely on a variety of instruments to fund uh, your activities, whereas in small economies, most of the activity is funded by ordinary deposits, whether of uh, small persons or institutional investors. Hmm. So the, the, the question arises as to how applicable is the bail-in model to uh, smaller type economies? Uh, ideally, of course, bail-in doesn't arise because the supervision is sufficiently good <laughs> so that, and, and there's enough capital in the banks that the equity investor has put enough capital. But I think even small countries can consider in the future as, as, uh, as their banking develops to encourage or even require banks to make sure that part of their funding is in the type of instrument, whether it's equity or whether it's subordinated types of bonds or special types of bonds that are on notice that if things go really badly wrong, they're going to take a hit. So that there's a clear distinction there between those and the ordinary depositor. Now, when we get past the issue of bailout and bail-in, a lot of discussion in recent times has been on resolution mm. and, 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 and changes in how financial institutions uh, can be and should be resolved. What are your thoughts on the, the new practices that are being introduced? Well, I think a lot of countries um, assumed that their banks would not get into trouble and they just uh, had dealt with banks that got into this situation through ordinary bankruptcy procedures. That doesn't work very well for a bank because markets move quickly. We we'll hold it there. We have to pause for a break. We'll be right back to continue our discussion with Dr. Patrick Honahan. 
Hey, don't you think it's about time that you were inside that hot new ride instead of just looking at it? How about actually going on that vacation instead of living it on Instagram? Then go for it with the money you can earn through savings bonds. They are a safe investment with an attractive 5.5% interest when you keep them for the full five years. And don't think you don't have enough money to buy savings bonds because you do. You can start with a $50 savings bond, then buy more whenever you want. And you can even cash them in anytime. Learn more at centralbank.org.bb or visit your commercial bank today to get your savings bonds and start saving now. Simplified economics with dynamic graphics for you. It's free and it's new. Though it's serious topics, so simple and appealing for you. It's free and it's new. Economic insight for BB Central Bank's new mic. All right, thank you, I'll take this one. Hello, my name is Patrick Honahan. I retired quite recently from being governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, and now I was invited by the Central Bank of Barbados to come and be a distinguished visiting fellow here for a short while. And well, I'm delighted to be back in this wonderful country. I want to share with you some of the lessons that I've learned from being governor of my own country, Central Bank, during Europe's serious economic and financial crisis of the last few years. So if you're interested, tune into CBC TV8 or VOB 92.9. That'll be at 8.30 p.m. on March the 30th. We can discuss what the best kinds of macroeconomic policy are available for a small open economy in today's world. Have a good day. Thank you. Welcome back to this interview with Dr. Patrick Hunahan, former Governor, Central Bank of Ireland, and the 2017 Central Bank of Barbados Distinguished Visiting Fellow. Patrick, before the break, we were discussing the issue of resolution of financial institutions and the current trend now to move away from relying on the courts to determine whether or not uh, institutions should be resolved, and rather allowing the regulator to move promptly and swiftly to resolve an institution and to allow compensation if anybody has been wronged in, in the process. What is your view on this new approach? You know, one thing I think that we really understood and learned in the crisis was uh, how fast markets move and move not in your favor if you're in the representative of the people. Uh, so you need to move as fast as markets to sort out a problem that has emerged. So if there's a failure of a bank, it needs to be dealt with quickly ideally over a weekend. It's not easy for courts to uh, assess from a standing start all the complexities of a uh, resolving an insolvent financial institution. So I think this is the strongest argument for giving that job to a special entity of government, a resolution entity. It could be the central bank or, or uh, it could be a, a separate entity. To have the power to separate what's good and survivable from what's not good and can't continue so that the bank can open on Monday morning, the resolved bank, whether it's merged into another institution or whether it's just a slimmed down entity, mm -hmm. and continue to provide the essential day-to-day -day services needed by, by businesses, small businesses and, and households, leaving the professional investors and the rest of the activity, some of the bad debt, uh, to be sorted out in due course. I think that's the, the only effective way to do this. Mm -hmm. And if anybody feels that they have been hard done by or that they would have done better out of a normal bankruptcy, then they can come and make their arguments in, in an orderly way in due course. That's the way everybody's moving. Actually, a lot of emerging economies and developing countries uh, adopted this plan a number of years ago, mm -hmm. but the European countries and some of the other advanced economies didn't think they needed to do that because they didn't imagine they'd have so many banking crises. So in a way, in this case, it's the advanced Europe. economies catching up on good practice that had already been applied in many other countries. The whole issue of deposit insurance, uh, you, you mentioned earlier you have a deposit in, in insurance scheme. There are those who believe that deposit insurance creates a moral hazard and, and therefore the banks take more risk because of the deposit insurance scheme. Uh, but more and more countries seem to be uh, developing uh, these schemes. 
Do you think that's the right direction? Well, there's always been a great debate about the, the moral hazard involved in a deposit insurance. But I think this battle, whether intellectually it's been won or lost, in practice it has been lost by the opponents of deposit <laughs> insurance. And I think most countries have, have moved decisively in favor of protecting the small, the small investor, just a, a, a low ceiling. Uh, and to some extent, it's the best way to thinking about this is that the small person can't really assess the quality of the management of a bank. Mm -hmm. And I you're really saying somebody's got to represent that person. And it's the deposit in insurance company or the bank regulator that is really representing the interests of that small person. And therefore, that small c person should be able to rely on a payout if there is a failure. I think we're talking in this case mostly about small financial institutions mm -hmm. where the deposit insurer will pay the relatively small amount, not the big for the big players, but the relatively small amount that's covered in deposit insurance schemes. And as I understand it, in Ireland, you have deposit insurance for both banks and credit unions. We do. Uh, we have deposit insurance actually up to, maybe it doesn't seem such a small figure, 100,000 euros. So uh, that would be o o over 200,000 Barbados uh, dollars I I fully covered in, in the deposit insurance scheme. And we've had occasion in Ireland to pay out on that in the case of just a small handful of, of uh, credit unions that uh, had to be liquidated. And we paid out as quickly as possible, which was uh, fortunately so quick that some of the credit union members didn't realize that uh, their credit union had been closed when they got the payout check in the post. Not easy to arrange, requires a certain amount of careful planning in advance. You made a point there of 200,000 in Barbados, it's uh, $25,000, but deposit insurance usually is related to the size of your, your GDP, so that you know, you, you can't necessarily say that one country has 25,000 and another has 200,000. Absolutely. And I, before the crisis, the ceiling was, uh, in, in Ireland, was 25,000 euros. It was upped just before the crisis. So I think it would, it's now on the, uh, on the, if you like, generous end. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can turn to the, the macroeconomy in, in, in Ireland, uh, would you say that you're out of the crisis? Well, I think we're out of the crisis, but there's still a, a recovery process. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, total employment is still below where it was before, at the peak before the crisis. But unemployment has fallen from 15% to 6.5% now. And, and uh, the numbers at work are growing by about 2.5%, almost 3% per annum in the last, uh, since, since the middle of 2012. So there's a, a, a strong recovery. But of course, a lot of debris left behind, a lot of damage caused, a lot of over indebtedness. And uh, nobody can feel that the problem has been put entirely behind us. Uh, there is a legacy. So in terms of the fiscal measures that you took uh, to address your, your situation, because obviously with the crisis, the fiscal deficit would have risen substantially as you, as you build out your institutions. What type of fiscal measures did you put in place to address the the, the economy? Well, I think that one of the things with the fiscal adjustments, um, tax rates had been lowered in the years before the crisis. They were brought back up. People were prepared to tolerate that because they felt, well, we had a few good years. The same even with the public servant salaries. I'm not saying it was easy for people to see their pay cut. And they were cut by an average of, uh, I think the number was 14%, which is a lot. But people who were getting that cut most of them had seen their salaries increase by a substantial amount in the years before. So it wasn't quite as bad as it might have been otherwise. Of course, it, for many people, it was bad. They had taken on undertakings on the basis that they thought what their income was going to be. So it was very painful. And uh, there were cuts in public services. And every agency of the public sector was squeezed. So were your uh, social expenditures and things, education and health and so on impacted also? All of these, all of these were squeezed, you know, class sizes growing and so forth. Okay, and, and the population, how did they buy into the, to these changes? You know, people often ask this question, and I think the answer may lie in the fact that Irish people are very globalized. They have friends and relations in the USA, in Britain, in Australia, all over. They understand how the world works. They don't like what has happened, but they know the adjustment has had to be made in order to get back onto a steady and sustainable path. So they grumble and they complain, 
but they put up with it and they respect the politicians that make those tough decisions. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about Ireland is its ta low tax rates. Uh, your corporate ration tax is now 12.5%, and I think that has allowed you to be able to attract a number of international companies to, to Ireland. But you do so at a time when the rest of Europe uh, is complaining about low tax rates in other jurisdictions. Uh, they even complain about it in Caribbean type jurisdictions. How does Ireland deal with that? Uh, there's no doubt that this um, business of low ta corporate taxation is controversial and will remain controversial. We always say in Ireland that it's not the only reason for people to come to Ireland, that there are other advantages, but there's no doubt that many of the companies and the high profile companies that have come have found the tax rate and the tax arrangements generally very advantageous. Uh, I've often said that Ireland needs to wean itself off these and that, the, that this era of low taxation uh, may eventually come to an end with pressure from other countries competing, saying this is, this is just a complicating uh, global tax, har maybe in the future we'll get a global tax harmonization. So I'm, I think we're at a, perhaps a period of future change. Uh, there's no change in policy that's fixed by the government, but uh, I think over time reliance on low tax is not really sustainable. So, so you don't see the opportunity to use the taxation tool as a competitiveness measure? I think it can be used for a time, but I think fundamentally the strength of an economy is based on the skills, the education of the people, the, the way the society is organized in order to be helpful to the conduct of economic affairs and protective of the people in terms of income distribution, providing services. These are the fundamentals of an, any economy. And just flipping a tax rate here or there mm -hmm. uh, really isn't going to give you a lasting benefit. Yeah, I think that's a point that we probably will discuss much over the, the, the coming weeks because I, I think that one of the issues that we also have to deal with is that of small size. And, and, and therefore, for very small economies, they don't get the sort of economies of scale to enable them to be as uh, naturally competitive as larger economies and therefore they have to tweak their policies in order to be able to be competitive and to compete with, with other countries in whatever services or, or, or goods they're producing. I think that's absolutely right. I think uh, small economies have to rely on other advantages of being nimble, uh, the advantages of everybody knowing everybody else. There are disadvantages, but there are also advantages. So we've got to play to our strengths. Uh, there are weaknesses and strengths. Economies of scale is a weakness, but uh, there are other uh, community strengths that we can rely on. Crisis management uh, and crisis management planning, uh, because you've just come through uh, a, a crisis, and I suspect that before the crisis, you did not pay a lot of attention to the whole issue of crisis management planning. But how was your perspective on, on that change now that you've come through that crisis? What I'd say about crisis management is the key is to know where you're going. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'd be knocked off. You say, well, we'll take this step and this step and this step to where we're going. And we're knocked off. But you can get back on if you know where you're going and if you can communicate where you're going. I think these are the keys to crisis management. If you don't know where you're going, then your crisis management falls back on a list of telephone numbers and that's not going to help you in the crisis. Right. So communication is, is critical. I think communication is very important. I think it's important for a central bank uh, especially because lots of people don't know what central banks do and if, if central banks suddenly, as it happened in our country, come into the public arena with, with major steps, the general public needs to know what are you doing and why are you doing it. And so credible communication, honest communication, I think is vital. You've had time to reflect on your country's response. Is there anything you would have done differently? Well, uh, as, I, uh, as I mentioned, I think reaching out to partners, doing that, we did it, but we could have done it earlier and more comprehensively. Uh, I think that is, we all live in an interdependent world, and if one country is in trouble, that is going to spill over to other countries. And if, if the interaction is close and quick, 
and nobody feels they've been hiding things unnecessary from, necessarily from the others, you'll get a cooperative solution. Sort of final word, because uh, Brexit is on the lips of everyone. What do you see as its impact on Ireland and on Europe? Uh, for me, Brexit is a, a blunder and, and an unfortunate development. It's very bad for Ireland in many dimensions. It uh, threatens to put another uh, dividing line on the island of Ireland between Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, um, and, and the Republic. It's bad for Europe as well. It takes a major player out of a community which was moving closer and closer together towards uh, a, a greater strength. We, we will have to figure out relationships with Britain, between Europe and Britain, between Ireland and Britain, in a reconfigured situation. But we'll come out of it alive. Yes, I, I think uh, everybody's concerned about it. Because uh, here in the Caribbean, we are looking to see what impact it will also uh, have on us. But I think this has been a very interesting and enlightening uh, discussion. And I look forward to the three weeks that you're going to spend with us and hope that you enjoy your stay. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, our viewers. Please check our website for a full schedule of Patrick's public engagements. I invite you to participate in our Caribbean Economic Forum with him and veteran Caribbean journalist Julian Rogers on March 30th, commencing at 8.30 p.m. The forum will be live on local and regional radio and television stations, the bank's website and Facebook. Be sure to send us your feedback on this conversation with Patrick. Thanks again and good day. Thank you.